Good evening to everybody. Uh, we're, if I look around, it's fantastic that you all came. Uh, my name is Tim. I am the CMO of the Albini Group. The Albini Group is an Italian family company, which is the proud owner of uh, Thomas Mason. Thomas Mason uh, has a strong link with Hong Kong, because before uh, we actually acquired the brand in 1992, Thomas Mason was already very, very present in Anglo-Saxon countries and many also in Hong Kong. So for us, when we spoke with Simon uh, about reorganizing another symposium, because we've done, this is not the first one on our track record together, we've done a few in Florence, we said, why don't we go to Hong Kong? Hong Kong is the first one in a series of three that we're going to do. So uh, after this one, in a month and a half, we'll go to Tokyo. There'll be, in the second half of the year, another one in New York. But now, I'm just exciting to hear what these fantastic city five gentlemen are going to say. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a pleasant talk and a pleasant talk. I'll pass over uh, the scepter to Simon. Thank you, Tim. And uh, just wanted to reiterate, Tim's thanks to everyone for coming this evening. Um, this is, I think, by my count, the seventh symposium we've done. Might be eight, I'm not sure. But the, one of the nicest things about doing these is the lovely audience and the people that want to come along and see some good discussion and serious participation as well. So thank you very much. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know, my name is Simon Crompton. Uh, I am a British author and journalist and the founder of the website PoemStyle.com. Um, in this symposium series, generally, we've tried to take some relatively meaty topics um, and give some in-depth discussion to them. And, um, today's, I think, is a very interesting one. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Hong Kong and China. We decided to broaden the, the uh, subject matter slightly and talk about both regions because I think, first of all, we're in Hong Kong. And I also think that it's really, for me particularly as an outsider, really interesting seeing how Hong Kong has become such a hotbed of uh, menswear craft and classic menswear that we love in the past 10, 15 years. At the same time, we've got China just next door, which is growing so incredibly fast and also has some of the top consumers of the kind of things that, that we love as well. So I think it'll be a really interesting dis uh, discussion. We're going to talk about where menswear craft in those two countries, Hong Kong and China, has come from, um, where it is at the moment, and then possibly kind of speculate about where it's going to be in the future, whether China is eventually going to to all the menswear craft companies in the rest of the world or not. Um, I'm delighted to say we have some amazing speakers um, this evening, um, in some ways kind of representing different stages of um, how menswear craft developed in this area as well. Um, so we have uh, on my right um, Tony Chang from Ascot Chang, um, a company with a long history in um, China and now in uh, Hong Kong as well, which we're going to talk about. Um, we have Mark Cho, one of the founders of the Armory um, in Hong Kong, which for many people is one of the first to spur a lot of interest in classic menswear around the world. Um, we have George Wang from Brio in Beijing, which again, really interesting for his perspective on um, the last few years of owning that shop and China itself. Um, and then we also have uh, Toby from Craftsman Clothing, which is a uh, much younger company than the other ones, but doing some really interesting things, working with manufacturing here in Hong Kong and in China. So we've got a really interesting spread um, of different um, histories which we're going to talk through. Um, perhaps to, to kick off, Tony, maybe just give us a little bit of background on, uh, on Ascot China, how it came from China down to Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, uh, I can give you a little brief history of the um, here in Hong Kong, because I'm the oldest mom here. I'm the second generation of Aspar Chan. Uh, my father apprenticed under a shirt maker in Shanghai back in the third, 1930s. And he came to Hong Kong in 1949 and he started his own shirt company, Aspar Chan, in 1953. And since then, we just um, we have prospered. We have now some of the stores as well. Um, so, a little history. I think we need to go back to, 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 to 1920s and 30s, back to Shanghai. And uh, those were the times that uh, Shanghai is like, uh, is, is named Paris of the East, because we have so many Western people, we have French and the British people, the German people. 
So uh, that's how tailoring business in Shanghai grew in the 20s and 30s. I read an article saying that back then, back in 1946, there were over 3,000 over 3, tailors in Shanghai. That's interesting. So I, I, never, I never knew why so much of that tailoring and serving seemed to originate in Shanghai, but it's because yes. it was the most international city at that point. At that time, Shanghai is, is the most international city. It's, uh, uh, probably just like now we have in Hong Kong. So back in 1940s and 1450s, a lot of these tailors from Shanghai migrated to Hong Kong, and that's how that's how. At one point, I heard there are hundreds of tailor shops in Hong Kong, and most of them are from tailors are from Shanghai. So uh, that's how we get this uh, famous name in Hong Kong, saying Shanghai Tailor. Why, why do people move from Shanghai down into Hong Kong? Uh, for economical reasons and also for political reasons. The people at that time uh, uh, moved from Shanghai to Hong Kong, and also a lot of business people from Shanghai, financial. Uh, or industry moved to Hong Kong. So they need clothing. And, uh, and also, Hong Kong is a British colony. Uh, a lot of British people in Hong Kong also need nice, uh, well tailored clothes. And at that time, Chinese tailors definitely is very, very, very high reputation. Their reputation is very, very high. It's interesting. So, uh, yeah, um, I guess as a, as a foreigner, you, you start to appreciate the fact that these kind of traditions for tailoring and classic menswear came when you had colonial influences, um, when you had like, in Japan after the Second World War, for example, and in China you had their influence in Shanghai, and then when those people were being chucked out of China, then that was when it all came down to Hong Kong. Yes, and Hong Kong at that time is really prospering. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, changing from a fishing, fishing village into an international city, and back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, a lot of exports, a lot of clothing manufacturing, and that, of course, it moved from clothing to all kinds of products, uh, electronics, and toys, and uh, now we have all more the financial yeah. sector. Mark, I know you work very closely at WW Chan, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening. Their history is quite similar, isn't it, following that same path? Yeah, that's right. Um, actually, a few years ago, I, I wrote an article uh, kind of detailing the migration of tailors from China to Hong Kong. And Tony Chang very kindly was a reference for the article as well as W.W. Chan, um, Peter Chan in particular. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the tailors that ended up in Hong Kong came by uh, either first or second generation from Ningbo, which is a very poor part of China, uh, to Shanghai or to northern cities in China uh, where they did learn from Russian tailors or from uh, European tailors, other European tailors in Shanghai. And then, as Tony says, for various political and economic reasons, like the Cultural Revolution, like the Cultural Revolution, blah, blah, they left and they came to Hong Kong and kind of transformed Hong Kong from a sleepy, sleepy, uh, a sleepy fishing village into kind of a major powerhouse today. George, I know you're based in Beijing, but do you know in Shanghai that many of those tailors still existing who didn't leave? Is that tradition still there at all? Um, for sure, I think there are. The tradition is quite strong in China, especially I think in the regions that used to be former colonies of European countries. If you look at where um, the suit manufacturers are based in uh, China today, they're in the northeast, they're in the, the, you know, the, the region near Shanghai, they're in the south part of China, they're also in Tianjin, which is next to Beijing, and these all used to be either um, shipping ports or used to be former colonies. So uh, I think that tradition, that skill set has survived. But instead of being small boutique tailor shops, they became more of a manufacturing and then supplying the world with tailor products for a very long time. What, I think you said earlier, why is it called the Red Gang of Tailors that came from Shanghai? Yeah, I, I've, I'm not sure if it's true, but I, the story that I've heard is that because the, the first tailors to teach the Chinese how to make uh, Western clothing were from, uh, I think, from uh, were Dutch or from. People started to refer to tailors as uh, you know, red hair, and then I guess later on they changed to red game, but uh, don't call me up. <laughs> it's true now, we've said it, it must be true. That's fine. That's all right. <laughs> Someone writes in Wikipedia now, then it's done. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know why that phrase is lost when the tailors moved to Hong Kong. I mean, it would have been an interesting thing to have kept. Yeah. Do you think they stand out just as much for the red hair in Hong Kong as they had done in? It could have been seen as like a uh, you know, 
sound like Linux style, it would be like a red game style. But you know, actually speaking of that, like the Shanghainese tailors did kind of cluster together in Hong Kong and separate from um, the originally present Hong Kong based tailors. Right? Yeah. Like actually Patrick Chu at WW Channel is talking about this, he was saying that a lot of the Shanghainese tailors were all like around Kimberley Road, like in Chatoi, and then a lot of the original Hong Kong tailors, um, who people speculate probably trained with Portuguese in Macau and then came over, like those guys were all around Wan Chai instead. So I mean I guess that happens in a lot of cities like that, a lot of immigration, isn't it? The people communities kind of stay together and group together, so you have different styles of the kind of work that in the same places. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tony, you, what was it like when, when you were growing up? Do you remember that, when there were that many tailors all along Kimberley Road? Oh yes, uh, on Kimberley Road, when, when my father has a shop, I still remember there's at least 19 different tailor shops. And ladies' tailors, uh, shirt manufacturer, shirt company, uh, a couple of men's tailor shops. And I still remember it vividly. It's, it's, it's a very vibrant uh, uh, place for tourists to come to Hong Kong to visit. So that they can visit store by store. And they, just, at that time, people, um, uh, tourists come to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a, uh, is, is a shopping paradise. They, they, they really buy a lot. And one thing I was, what I, you were saying about them all being on Kimberley Road, I find it interesting because today, actually, we associate a lot of those tailors with being in hotels. But at some point, it seemed to be the established thing that every hotel had a tailor they could offer to their guests. I guess it's, as I said, due, due to the 1960s, 70s, that Hong Kong is really a, it's, it's a, it's a place for tourists to come and uh, to come to shop. So, um, and at that time, there's so many new hotels comes up, and so this tailor company want to open store in the hotel to, to cater to this market. Mm. So, um, and I would say all the tailor shops at that time I heard of is all very prosperous and uh, do, 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 a, do a great business. So let's to actually just jump in. Like, I think this was kind of a Hong Kong culture thing, because I've never noticed this in other cities. Like, people really congregate socially in hotels, and that doesn't really happen in a lot of other cities. Like um, I guess it's, it's just because, because Hong Kong people are very adaptive. You know, that, at that time, during because the market really catered for a lot of tourists coming to Hong Kong. So, the tailoring, uh, the, this, ta uh, this tourists come to Hong Kong, they really want to shop for custom clothing. So, and that's why all these hotels also invite a lot of these fine tailors. Like, Asperger was invited to the Nisru Hotel back in 1963. So, uh, that was one of the reasons my father started this. Branch, yes. I'm sure my father would love to maintain the Kimberley Rouge to shop, except uh, it was because of the development that we had. So, so when was the was the peak? So 50s, 60s, that was the peak for that kind of custom clothing? Was, uh, 60s, 70s, okay. even to I think early 80s. And so, and so into the 90s, that was the time when it was the big fashion brands started taking over. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The brand is the world, no takes the world. But, um, at that time, uh, all brands have shirts, all brands have clothing, and they, they come out with all different uh, design, styling. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the younger generation, during that period of time, they all came to buy a great uh, you know, quality brand, like Lord Germani, Google Ball. That really takes on the fashion world immensely. So how did, how did you survive those 60 years? The 90 must be the hardest time. Well, as Chan does witness the, the, the ups and downs of catering business in Hong Kong since 1950. Uh, of course, I didn't know the early really part because I only joined the company in 1997. Um, definitely, uh, uh, during, uh, I think, one thing that most important for custom tailoring, custom clothing is, is really because we are servicing a group of customers that they are looking for something that special that they need. So if you, as long as you are catering that, if you are servicing the customer, you are selling them, you are you are you are giving them the, 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 
clothing that really fits me. So this is how we, we nurture our customers so that the customer will come back. So this is how s chain grows from, from there on to even up to now. Um, I will always say custom clothing business is, is, is a niche. It's always there. It can never die. And I think that's the point we'll get onto slightly later as well, which is a good one, is that throughout Ascot Chang's history, it's really been something that people needed and had to have, where it's part of a uniform for day-to-day -day wear, and the question is if that still exists in, in new societies, particularly in China, for example. Um, but, okay, so let's maybe then shift forward. If we're looking at um, when Mark, you and I guess George as well were kind of here um, and aware of Hong Kong, was it when you were growing up, was it mostly then brands dominated? I, I didn't grow up here, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it is it is an interesting question because um, again I, I had a similar conversation with Patrick at W Chan. The '90s was tough, I think, for a lot of custom clothing guys. Uh, I think ready to wear really hit the scene in a big way and kind of took a lot of tailors off guard, caught a lot of tailors off guard. And when young customers really started to come back into the shops. It was mid 2000s, and frankly, a lot of it was South Forum. Like, I certainly spent a lot of time on South Forum, uh, like early 2000s too. I think you can't underestimate how important the internet was in like revitalizing tailoring uh, for Hong Kong tailors, especially. And did that was that particularly in in Hong Kong? Is there something about Hong Kong with just the the concentration or or the of people like that, professionals looking for clothing, that means it has a particular impact? I think it was a bunch of stuff. So, um, first, I think in Hong Kong, generally, you can get pretty good to very good tailoring for not very much money. And so that really gives you the opportunity to experiment, to try new things, uh, and, you know, like, they can do it quickly. I certainly built a lot of experience purchasing tailored clothing for myself um, in Hong Kong as a result, like, in a way that I could have never realized in, say, the UK or in the US or anywhere else, or even in Italy. So you could buy far more suits and never realize much quicker the things actually you really liked or really Yeah, wore. you could buy far more faster. So I guess with 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 social media and things like Star Forum, is it because there's, there's just so many tailors in Hong Kong that the hard thing is to know actually which are any good or which have a, a decent style and you need experience of others to kind of tell you that? Yeah, I, I think having all those different tailors basically next door to each other um, forces the consumer to really like pay attention to what they're picking, right? And when you are forced in this position where you have to make qualitative choices on like, is this good, is this bad, is this good, is this bad, it, it sharpens your eye a lot faster too, and you start to develop a taste better. Like. like weirdly, because um, I grew up in the UK, I couldn't find any clothes that fit me. I was a size 36, and like if you go to the average UK store in the 90s, like it'll start at 38, maybe 40. Like it's really, really hard to find 36s. So I ended up developing a lot of my case very early on simply because I look so hard to close it. Um, and George, was it the same for you? Were you influenced by Style Forum, those discussions early on? Um, yeah, sure. I think Style Forum was very important. It was the only venue where people can discuss those type of things. Um, and I, I arrived in Hong Kong in 2004 and I worked in finance, so I had to dress in tailoring pretty much every day. And that's when I started to to wear it and start to get into it. Um, but um, very quickly I began to like Italian style and like the more softer look. Um, so I didn't really spend that much time in Hong Kong working with local tailors. I, I really, when I had an opportunity, I would go to Japan and then buy ready to wear Italian brands, which at that time was the only place where you could get them. Um, and then when I had more freedom, uh, you know, from 2010, I started to go to Italy uh, for the sole purpose of buying this book. And that's kind of my history with the style. Um, but, you know, over the course of the past you know, 10 years or so, I, the local tailors have definitely changed as well. I mean, both, sorry, sorry. Like, we met in 2006 or 2007, something like that, like more than 10 years. And there was like a bunch of those, like you, me, Alan, Gary Talk, who wrote that Master Shoemaker book. Um, uh, I forgot his name. 
Guido Wongarini. It's sad that I know people by their Instagram names. Um, you know, like, when you get a bunch of people, Grandma, there we go. Like, when you get a bunch of those people together and get to talk about tailoring and nothing else because you're a bit sad, like, that's, that's a great way to develop knowledge, too. Yeah, I think that, I think Hong Kong also helped all of us develop our tastes and preferences because I don't see any other place and any other city in the world where you can gather, you know, these people together um, that just come from the smallness of the city and, you know, whatever your interests are, you, know, you can find someone who shares a similar interests within, you know, five kilometers of you and it's very easy to get together and you don't need to have purely the discussion online, you can also have offline discussions as well, especially when it comes to tailoring, it's such a three-dimensional thing. It's so much better to actually see and feel it mm. and to wear it than to just talk about it and look at photos. Because the photos are just a horrible way to look at clothing and style in general. And Toby, to bring you in here, is is it the same was it the same for you when you were discovering clothes? Did social media and things like Star Form have a big influence? Absolutely. So um my partner and I actually met on the forum. It wasn't Star Forum, um, it's called HK Discuss. And then back, I think it's around 10, 15 years ago, we were into like streetwear and stuff. And that's how our relationship was formed, and then that's how we started this um, company. But then at first, our first uh, initial orders was, was actually a GMTO from Style Forum uh, Customs. Yeah. And then, um, so the first two years, we were just selling on Instagram. We didn't even have, have a proper website, right? And then um, now with e-commerce and stuff, like things are moving a lot quicker. But um, I think all the brands um, should not make that uh, social media. Yeah. And so, um, if we so keeping roughly in that kind of chronological order, order, Mark, then when you started the Armory, you were inspired by those a lot of things you had seen and a lot of things you had made, and wanted to produce something that would service this market. But you were one of the, the, the Armory the first to do that. You know, why was what kind of stuff all the time, and I still liked it, and I was like, oh, I should probably do something with this if I still like this, right? And fortunately, you know, as you dig and dig and dig, you get to see a lot of great tailors, you get to handle a lot of great product. Like, for instance, George was actually the first one to introduce me to Keton. Like, I'd never handled a proper Keton jacket, and I saw George's, you know, and that, as George was saying, like, you can't figure these things out in photos. You have to handle it. And once you handle it, then you really get a sense of like what that product is too. And may maybe sticking with the Hong Kong theme, do you think it was, was it that much easier to do it in Hong Kong? Do you think it would have happened quite so easily? Because it seems, again, from an outsider's point of view, you know, it only comes to Hong Kong very rarely, that there seems to be just this kind of melting pot of these kind of people and these kind of shops, but which, you know, which I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily pick in Hong Kong as the obvious place that to happen. Well, for the armory, Hong Kong was the first choice because we had such a close relationship with WW Chen. And um, a lot of people might not know this, but like that store that we have in the Pedro building was originally meant to be for WW Chen. Like I found that location for them and I was like on the way to negotiating it for them. But then they decided, oh, it's like not quite right for us. And so I thought, oh, well, I really want to do this. I'll do it and you guys can work with it. So I don't know if you remember, but like WW Chen and and us, like, we used to take orders on that WW Chan for the first couple of years. Yeah, I remember meeting you and Alan in some hotel in Mayfair somewhere. It was the first time I think I met either of That's not a good way to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't explain it like that. <laughs> it's a wonderful evening. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about how you took your pants off. <laughs> um, and, the, uh, and then maybe if we... One thing I find interesting is, that, is this... Um, dynamic between Hong Kong and China because we've established that Hong Kong has unique reasons for, for these kind of things often happening here. But then, um, George, when you started in, in Beijing, I mean, you were, you were based there, right? That's where you thought. But was it also to do with what China was like at a market, as a market at that point? That was a place to, an obvious place to be? Well, I mean, I, I started, I got into the style, you know, I think way before the, the market was ready in China. Um, I never really thought that I would open a store one day, um, but you know, at the time when I was thinking about it, Armory had already opened for what is it, ten years ago, twenty, yeah, you know, more or less ten years ago. has has been around for a while, and I've come to know the people in the trade 
quite well. Um, and they're, they're, they, you know, in 2014, 2013, they're, in China, people are beginning to, to recognize this, this genre, um, but there aren't any local options available at the time. To be compared to Hong Kong, at least you had local tailors who are very, very good quality tailors. Uh, in China, there was more or less nothing. And I just thought, you know, I'm there. I have the resources. I have the drive, the passion for it. Um, if I don't do it, you know, it would be a shame, right? Um, so that was really the only reason I did it. Um, and we opened in 2015, January, and we're going on to our fifth year. And, um, and then, you know, if you look at the Hong Kong market today, it seems very vibrant, very, very, very good, uh, fast growth. But I remember when, when the Army first opened, you know, it was very quiet. I used to hang out there quite a bit, but no one was walking in. But of course, Mark has done a great job with, you know, with this things. And he has really opened up the market, I think, in Asia for a lot of us and people that came after. Actually, just going back, because I, I realized I didn't answer your question, I was too busy talking myself. Um, the great thing about Hong Kong, again, is because there's so many tailors. And so when we opened the armory, we were actually really worried, are people going to understand something like a Neapolitan made to measure garment, like a Razio, which is like soft, but fully handmade, blah, blah, blah. And actually, yes, they really understand it, because they've already cut their teeth looking at stuff from other tailors, right? They put it on, they're like, oh, this really does feel different. Like, that education is really important. And for George, you know, I think, like, it is definitely a struggle because you have to do so much more education to get the Chinese cu customer up to a knowledge level that's similar to Hong Kong's, too. I think in the, in the beginning, when we first opened, I think social media wasn't that uh, prevalent as, as it was today. I think Instagram was just startable. So, you know, most of the customers that we got in the first you know, year or so, they, it was like their first first bespoke order. So we have to first of all explain what bespoke is, what tailoring is, and also the particular style that we were doing at the time. It, it seemed very confusing, right, as a customer. So actually we tried not to talk too much. We just, you know, give them a suit and let them kind of figure it out on, on, on their own. And, but, you know, social media came and it, the market grew really fast. People, the customers became much more sophisticated in the very short term. Now it's much easier, but at the same time it's becoming much more competitive as well. So the difficulty level of doing business hasn't really changed. It's just you're faced with different challenges. Tony, have you have you seen the Chinese market change in the time you've been in the China? Well, we've been in China market for almost 20 years. Um, uh, well, China market definitely changed. Oriented. And, um, and people are now, we, we 
really think through what they buy. It's worth that I pay $50,000 for that jacket suit with this cash in the uh, Now I'm sure we're talking about Albini, Thomas Mason. They are selling much more in 102 plus, 122 plus, and 42 plus. Before they might be selling the, the 300 yard count. I remember one time I asked them, can you ship me a few hundred yards of this fabric? They said, oh, it'd be also to Chinese money. Kind of you know? Because at uh, that time, the, the, the high price, the, uh, the top quality fabrics, to sell for instantaneous in China. So, so they're getting a little bit more discerning and educated for the kind of things they want, or know why they want them? Um, I would say at that time, yes. But now I would say the market is more mature. But I think the China market still has the potential to grow, but it's, uh, you know, I would say the younger generation like Mark, George, and Toby, they will need to create something that create the younger generation to another sense of fashion. So, do you have many customers at the moment from China, and how do you find those quite a discerning customer uh, from China recently? Sorry, sorry. 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 Sorry, you would think in China, like everyone has this uh, same habit, right? But that's not true. Like especially in, let's say, compared to Beijing and Shanghai, I think Shanghai um, the customers are more like Hong Kong. So like, I think they're more um, they they would do more research before coming in and you know buy the product. But in Beijing, uh, they would have more high ticket um, clients. That would just we don't. is that not true? <laughs> Because <laughs> that, that's all I heard from our, um, you know, from from the orders too, from yeah, uh, yeah for our jackets. I think I think if your customer has to do a lot of research before they come to you, you're not doing a good job as a retailer. I think you you should as a retailer you should inspire confidence in your customer and they should just come and shop with you. And if, if they have complete trust in you, then that you should you should be doing what you're doing. If, if if you're arguing constantly with your customers about what is right, what is wrong, then maybe you should think about what you're doing. Um, and do you? I'm interested in this picture of kind of Hong Kong as a um, fairly sophisticated market because a lot of because of its international presence because of the. The, the time that money and trade has been here, and also the number of tailors, and then China is this much, much faster growing and faster changing market, and how much, um, I think, how much impression from the outside is true, and in, in the, well, what I hear a lot, and, and people tell me, is that Chinese consumption is changing extremely fast. Um, tailors will tell me that they've, you know, they've been uh, you know, traveling around the world for 20 years, and they've seen the Middle Eastern clients or the Russian clients not changed their taste at all in that time, but in that in the last just five years, Chinese clients have changed hugely from wanting the big brands or very or big, very bright things to wanting actually much more sartorial or classic things. Is that do you think that's a a trend, or is it or a, um, is that something that's going to go away, or is that actually just a maturity of the taste? Um, I, I think in general, the wealth that has been created in China are fairly new. So there, there, there isn't that much established taste or preferences or aesthetic in the Chinese fashion market. So people are very much driven and influenced by trends and marketing. Um, I mean, even in classic menswear, which is considered a staple in you know, more developed uh, countries and markets. In China, I think it's very much a trend. I think people are swinging to this trend at the moment. <coughs> But someday, you know, something else will capture your attention, and you know, go 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 to a complete different direction. Um, but you know, I, I think it's very encouraging that companies like Ascot Chang and W Chan has been around for generations. I think if you are truly high quality, um, you offer something unique, you will have 
enough space to, to continue on. Just to add a little bit to that, um, because you mentioned, like, you talked to British tailors and they say that their Russian or their Middle Eastern clientele shops in a certain way. And this alludes also to what Tony Chang was saying. Um, I went to a middle school friend's wedding. He lives in New York and he married uh, this Russian lady. And so this is the first time I've been to a Russian wedding. And I tell you what, man, if you go to a Russian wedding, you will understand why everyone is wearing a dark, shiny suit. Because like the entire thing just happens in very, very dark areas. I was invited to the wedding brunch the next day. The wedding brunch, which was supposedly by the seaside, was in a nightclub by the seaside at 4 p.m. in the basement, right? Like, in those sorts of environments, right, that's the culture. Like, if that is your culture, then actually the clothes that you're buying, had, that's the need for those clothes. The yep. need for those clothes is to be shiny and noticeable in an environment like that. And so their taste has matured in that specific way for that specific need. Yeah, so, and so I guess what, what we're talking about, we find it hard to predict potentially how China's going to develop in that sense because it's just moving so fast and as, as George said, the money is so new that you don't have the establishment of that culture in the same way. I mean, I think a lot of us, particularly in the West, can take, the, take it for granted that we have certain uh, reference points and certain assumptions about clothing which are built off things we've grown up with or our peers or our friends or our family, but you just don't have that necessarily in new markets like China. Is that fair, George, do you think? Yeah, I think that's very true. I think, you know, when when the kids of my current customers, when they grow, they're going to have those reference points from their fathers. And at that time, maybe the market will be much more mature than they are today. But hopefully it won't take you know, that long. Um, maybe, and also what I'd like to touch on, that's goes to guess, China from the consumption side, but from a, a manufacturing or production side, you can see how that's changed or developed as well. Because I find, at the moment, I keep on seeing you know, new brands starting, new shops starting. We hear about them, they come in London or they come to London for trunk shows. Uh, and they're often working with a small factory or a small workshop in China. And my question is, have those workshops always been there? Um, to doing something completely different and waiting for this to come along? Um, are the workshops themselves changing and becoming more innovative and modern? Or is it just the fact that people are going there and asking for particular things? Does that make sense? Um. I think the manufacturing in China is set up for large scale orders. So it's very difficult to find suppliers in China if you're a small brand, if you're a small business. Um, so what ends up happening is you have to go from manufacturer to manufacturer because maybe you know this season they might have a little gap in their production schedule so they can accommodate you. But then you know, next season they receive a large order from a big brand and you have to go find someone else. Um, but in general, I think the manufacturing quality in China is it's at the top. Um, you know, personally, there is no longer any stigma associated with made in China in, in, in particular genres and categories. I think Chinese manufacturing are probably the best in the world in, you know, in terms of technical clothing, uh, in terms of meatwear. Um, you know, you can find the best manufacturers in China. The only problem is to find the the one who's doing both good quality and at the same time willing to accept small orders. And you know, I have a friend who, who has his own brand in, in Beijing and he ended up having to book the production of the small factory that he, he's working with for the full year in order for them to accommodate him. So he's basically underwriting you know, the income of that particular factory. And that's, you know, in terms of cost, it's probably on the same level as Japan. If you're making a pair of jeans in Japan, it's probably, it will probably cost you the same as if you were making in China, but then you don't really get that recognition in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, that's, that's, that's the current situation. I don't know where, where it's going. Uh, Toby, how do you find it? Because you have production in China and in Hong Kong, right? Oh, yeah. sorry, Toby, not Toby. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, so our bespoke and MPM orders are actually in Hong Kong and then ready to wear out in China. The reason for that is because even though Hong Kong's wages are much higher than China, but um, we want to keep the QC high. And whereas, because TC and I are based in Hong Kong, and it, it's just way too uh, many households to you know travel back and forth, and that's why we decided to keep uh, the bespoke and MPM based in Hong Kong. 
just it's just more it's easier to keep track of production if it's local, basically. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. That I think I, it's again, it's not. I think it's exaggerated as a trend, but in the UK, you do see brands coming back that used to make in China and now making in the UK. Um, and I think mostly it's, yeah, they get very good part of PR if they do it that way. But um, they always say the big benefit is not quality or anything like that. The big benefit is the fact that actually you just can drive an hour and go see your factory and correct something rather than having to try and do it online or fly from the side of the world. Basically. Um, and Tony, do you have any questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any experience in that from a production point of view? Um, as Toby said, you know, the, definitely the production in Hong Kong can have a closer eyes on it. But nowadays in Hong Kong, it's very, very tough to find retailers and I uh, uh, say that uh, the, the few retailers we have still in the you know, in our workshops so testing clothing they are all close to 70s so I don't know how long they can survive in, uh, whether they can see that for the energy and the, uh, the eyesight to, uh, to find so um, eventually I think you know, the production has to move into China because there you can still find some some younger people, they are more committed people. Uh, um, I must say that right at this point, we still up to 80 85 percent of the house that we still in Hong Kong. But we have to go into China for finding the right ones. Otherwise, you can't find any people in Hong Kong. In the past five years, we tried to hire a couple of people and they just, just left in no time. It's interesting because I think in in London we're kind of seeing the opposite. In the, in the past ten years, where tailoring has become more trendy and bespoke, and more trendy in tradition and craft and so on, and there's more people wanting to learn to be bespoke tailors in South Road than there are places to fill them. Um, so you've had an increase in understanding as a consumer, but also as makers, there's been that kind of increase as well. But that that doesn't seem to have happened in Hong Kong particularly or China. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. No. I, I, you know, I, I, I know, you know, in the audience tonight there are, you know, many people who are operating their own tailoring business, and, and I think, you know, each each of you has a responsibility to really push forward the craftsmen who are working on those, you know, those products behind the scenes because, you know, until that profession is considered prestigious and inspiring, young people won't go into it, and then, you know, you, you can no longer find people. Actually produce, so you know. Please, you know. That I think is your responsibility to really push forward the actual craftsman working behind the scenes, who's doing all the work. And you know, if if you're good at social media, you know, stop posting photos of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. <laughs> Start posting photos of people, you know, stitching their jacket together, cutting the cloth. You know, start doing that and, and really tell the world that very high quality production is available in China. Yeah, I actually wanted to just mention, because it is, it is kind of pet peeve of mine, like I think that Hong Kong as a tailoring industry never really priced in the cost of the next generation. Like for a long time, they went on, were cheap and were fast and were pretty good, but because of that, they never really priced in the cost of what will it take to attract the next generation? What's the marketing that's required to create a brand? Um, you know, how do we create prestige around what we do? And you know, because you don't do that, you're left with a situation today where it's just hard to attract the right people to come work in this business. Is, is it hard in a way, you might not know, but is it hard in a way because there are so many tailors, so many tailors in a way in Hong Kong that it's seen as you would get dug into that code career because it's seen as a certain kind of thing. It's <coughs> Low quality, fast tailor, whereas in England, associated with Savile Row, it's seen as slightly more prestigious or craft based, more serious. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Savile Row, if you were to go back to Industrial Revolution, like Savile Row is also basically a big factory, too. You know, like Savile Row used to pay lousy wages and it was tough and blah blah, but they outgrew that and they priced in, um, whether by design or just by sheer greed, you know, that, like the cost of like having the next generation. Um, okay, well, if we've very roughly talked through the history of Hong Kong and China, and we've talked through how it's developed in the last 30 odd years to point now, how about in terms of the, the future? Are we, are we optimistic for the future of Hong Kong, China from craft point of view? 
thirty five. Uh, for me, I I would point out that is the rental in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> I think catering business that I talk about will never go away. You know, there is always a need. There are always people needed to find clothing. Be it uh, they need to fit, or be it they want the quality of making, or the, the style. But uh, now the Hong Kong rental, you know, if our business cannot catch up the rental, then you it's, it's too much of a commercial and a shopping hub that's driving out some of those lanes, basically. Yes. yes. But in terms of China, I think the market is, is uh, if, if the, if the, uh, the, the economy in China grew in the pace as we are now, I'm sure in, you know, the, the market for menswear definitely will come back very, very quickly. And, and hopefully we have a group of uh, mature customers, they really know what they want, mm. then it's time that we can really, really show them that what we need. Uh, Toby, I guess you must be relatively optimistic, you just started your own brand. <laughs> How do you see the future? Very optimistic. Um, I actually know a shirt maker. Well, they're, they don't, they're not really artisanal, but um, what they do is, in China, they, they would have, have uh, different tailors to go to your location, your office, or your home to uh, measure your uh, body for you. And then they're selling around 15,000 shirts a month. Like, it's ridiculous. And then it, it, I think the market is there. And, and like Tony said, there's a need. But it's just, you have to, I think we have to blend retail and digital together. And then um, there are brands like Indochino or um, Bonobos, like all these digital giants, right? But they don't know the craft, right? But I mean, if we can blend these together, that would be something interesting. Uh, George, do you see if you see this as being a trend? Um, a trend. China's much more trend driven. Does that mean that you, in the future, have to plan for maybe changing your offering a little bit, or what do you think? Well, in, when I when I started, really, it was very much what I what I liked, and and then later on. You know, I started to get customers and started to communicate with customers with the market. I think I changed a bit to try to cater to other people's taste, but I feel like I've swung too far. So in the past few seasons, I've been kind of coming back because I think at the end of the day, each store or business has to have have an identity, and you can't cater to everyone. If I'm, if I'm just selling to the people who agrees with me, who likes what I do, that's fine. You know, I think the market is big enough for you know, a very diverse um, retailing scene to, to exist. And that's, I hope that's what happens. I don't want a bunch of stores that are exactly the same. I think that would be boring, both for customers and for people who are actually operating the business. It's interesting, isn't it, because I think there's often you guys obviously know much better than me, but there must be this tension the whole time between a lot of people start a brand or they start a shop because there's something they really love and they want to talk about it, they want to represent it, they want to sell it. Um, but their, their taste don't necessarily change at the same speed as the market might change, for example. You know, so you can't necessarily have the luxury of aligning those two things forever unless you just you know, start something you love and then sell it to the ground and no one likes it anymore and then you know, go do something else. And Mark, how have you found that in the past? Nine, ten years. Yeah, I mean, I like we develop our collections in house, so we are looking at thousands of fabrics a season and comparing it down to 15 pieces a season, so 30 pieces a year. Like, when you are looking at that many fabrics year in, year out, like, definitely your taste will be changing faster than the marketplace. The marketplace is just not seeing that many variations of a theme or that many variations of an idea. Um, but, and you know, this is why I like this business too, like, as much as it is a product business, it is also a hospitality business. And I do enjoy, like, getting to know my customer and being able to try and do something that actually will serve them properly, you know? Like, like again, it goes back to need. Like, I'm, I'm glad that I'm needed by the customer and I can do something for them. And, um, and maybe just one last kind of forward-looking question before we see if anyone's got any questions in, in the audience. 
I'm quite interested from a, a style point of view, whether China or Hong Kong or even either of them will ever develop their own kind of distinctive style because it feels like it feels like you know a lot of the things, a lot of the shots here, um, a lot of the brands were kind of inspired by you know, Italian makers or some other kind of makers, and and then a lot of the shops are kind of you know, copied the same kind of things in the same styles. Do you think there'll ever be a distinctive style of the region, or is basically everything too internationalised and similar on social media that ever to happen? Maybe Toby, what do you think? Do you think this could be a style that's more distinctive of, of uh, this region? I think it, it depends on the climate and location. I remember um, after pity, I was wearing this tobacco linen suit in London, and this guy was like, "What, what are you wearing?" Like, this guy just walked us straight. Like, what are you wearing? <laughs> right? But then it's it's different because like um, in in Italy, when the sun is always out and it's hot, you don't want to wear an English suit. You know, that's like the same in Hong Kong. It's it's humid here. It's it's always hot. But then in when you go into the office, it's always like super freezing and whatnot. So you, you, you have you need to have something that, that fits the climate instead of you know, I think that it's a climate that, that shapes the norm. If you can develop some kind of style that means that you have a jacket you put on when you go indoors basically to, to warm yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, George Mark, any views whether there can ever be a distinctive Chinese or Hong Kong style? I think it's very difficult today because of social media. I think if you look at the popular accounts in, in the classic menswear, people are dressed pretty much the same. And if that's what you're aspiring to be like, then you're going to dress the same. And you know, I would like there to be more creativity and, 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 and more individual, you know, expressions. But uh, it's difficult. But the person who did, who, who does it, is going to be the winner in my opinion. Mark, any views? It's a tough one. Like I, I never set out to represent particular. Like I never said, oh, I'm representing all of Asia or Hong Kong or whatever, right? Like the army does certain things. Well, also, Whether you're, I mean, you're more international than most, and that you have you're selling a largely similar products in New York and Hong Kong, right? Yeah, they can be very different markets. Oh, I mean, like from day one, like our goal is to be an international clothier, right? Like we love the idea that there's great stuff all around the world, and every country has their own particular view on how a thing should be made, and that view is nuanced by um, cultural and historical influences too. Like it's, I just think that's such an interesting intersection of like art and history. Um, but in terms of like, is there even a space in the canon of classic menswear to fit a new style that could be identified called Hong Kong? Actually, I never thought about it the way Toby did, and I think he's probably closest to the mark. Like, Hong Kong is bloody hot outside, it's quite cold inside, so some sort of garment that would fit that need is probably the most Hong Kong thing you can come up with. There aren't that many places like that either. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I, I think I hope you agree, we've had a, a, a stimulating discussion so far on the history and the future of Hong Kong and China. Um, I'd be very interested to hear questions from the audience for our panel. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Please just raise your hand if anything you'd like to ask. Oh, don't be shy. So, I just want to know what you all think about the women's suit market. It doesn't exist. What <laughs> <laughs> did you expand to I, I actually just saw a title from, I think, South, Morning, uh, South China Morning Post. Uh, in 10 years, more women will be wearing suits than men in China. I, I don't think that there's... <laughs> There is no such thing as women's suit, suiting or tailing market because there are just there's just so so little consumers. You know, if you want to make a suit, you can go to the armory and make a suit. I don't think there needs to be a, a store or a business that caters only to women. I don't, I don't think the market is big enough or ever get big enough for that to exist. Is it not just more fashion driven? Do you have to be much more aware? I think of the problem is. I, I, I hate, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm making a generalization, but I am, but I think women are generally driven more by what's current, and um, if you have to wait even just a couple months to get a suit made, that's not a very appealing idea. Well, given, given we're all men, maybe, do you find that's the case? I think it's quite hard to say so soon, 
But I think with um, women becoming more and more at the forefront of news and becoming more powerful in the world, I think many of them are looking to suits to give them the sense of like autonomy, you know. And especially on the runway now, a lot of women are wearing suits. So I just thought like I wanted to hear men's perspective because that's my perspective. You know, I always tell people the worst part about menswear is all the men in it. So, like, you know, the two women's suits would be kind of nice as a change. Um, we actually do sell some women's suits uh, just to order. Uh, the problem is that the variation in women's bodies, uh, at least coming from like a tailoring background, is much greater than what we're used to. Um, so, yeah, the best way for people like us to handle it. Uh, as like menswear guys who might want to adapt the product slightly, is really just have like a set number of models uh, and a set number of body types that would work with those models, right? Like we're just we spent a long time developing our skills in menswear, but we would have to redevelop everything um, really to properly, properly serve womenswear. So for George, because like Dalcore does a little bit of women's stuff too, right? Like I have a lot of the tailors we work with, they would you know they would accept orders from. Women customers. Yeah, like we'd love to, but at the same time, as people who like take what we do quite seriously, I don't want to half-ass it, right? Like I don't want to just make something up on the fly because I, but I truly don't understand a woman's needs for a suiting that well. I, I think technically, making a suit or jacket for men and or for women, it's not that different. But um, I once talked to a tailor that I work with who, who refuses to make for women. His reason was that he can't meet their expectations because he doesn't understand what women want. So he he doesn't want to disappoint his customers. This actually would be a good time to give a shout out also to Catherine Sargent on on Savile Row because she actually does do beautiful women's work, and there are actually a couple of tailors who do great women's work too, right? I was just going to say actually, I think Catherine's a great example because she very very um, specifically for every woman when women come in, has a book of sketches and examples of all the different styles of suits you can make. Because she says the problem with women is some, people, some women are used to wearing a, a jacket which is just phenomenally tight, and that's what they want, that's what they're used to, and it's incredibly short. Whereas other one, maybe the fashion, what they're used to is something which is slightly more drapey and loose. Um, and neither of those things have anything to do with menswear, so you have to establish very early on with a female customer actually the kind of suit they're after, and that will be, they'll be you know, four, five, six different styles that they might want, whereas the men's are really, really only one of those. And that's the biggest challenge for her. And if you can narrow those down really a lot from the start, then there's a chance of making it. But she makes a lot of women's clothing that works for her, but it has to be visual examples, otherwise it can't be expectations. So why do you think Italian tailoring has been more popular in China and Hong Kong than British tailoring? I think we, in the age of social media, we live in a hashtag culture. I think there are just more things on an Italian jacket that you can hashtag than on a British jacket. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. So, so basically, there's more uh, words that sound cool in Italian that you can repeat, basically. No, I mean, like, you have the, the shirt shoulder, you have, you know, the dark one. I mean, because... When people are buying fashion, they are not just buying clothes, they're buying, you know, a lifestyle, they're buying, you know, a lot of other things with it. Yeah. So the better they're able to comprehend what they're buying, the easier it is for them to part with their money. So I think that's the real reason why Italian style is more popular than British style because it's easier to communicate the idea of Italian style. Everything is more on the surface, it's more superficial, it's more apparent. Um, that's my opinion. I think it also it goes to a point you, you made earlier when we were talking about what was a really good one, which is for most customers, and particularly your customers, people are coming and buying the suit uh, and getting into tailoring for the first time um, because they think it's cool, they think it's fit to style, they like, they've seen someone wearing it and look very cool. It's only later on they realize some of the heritage stuff and the craft stuff that we really like, or the relationship stuff. It has to have that initial draw of looking cool and being trendy in some way, right? Yeah. And I think maybe we've been quite fortunate in having that in the last few years, but the, the challenge or the kind of scary thing is that, that might not last forever. You don't have people who become aware of tailoring for long enough to really realize another advance. Uh, thank you.
elegance because, um, well, the society is basically just dressing down, right? You see guys in t-shirts and jeans. And then when you, uh, you know, with this like huge padding English suit, you just look, I don't know, it's, the contrast is just so huge. I think wearing a suit is a choice rather than, than um, a, a rude I guess, in office especially, even in, uh, I think J.P. Morgan, right, they they just announced that you don't Common have to sense, wear a suit, yeah. uh, Common sense. you don't have to wear a suit or tie to work anymore. So, yeah, it, Italian, I think it's just, you know, more straight set to that. Yeah, so it, it speaks slightly less cynical to George, perhaps, it's like, uh, yeah, maybe casualization, I mean, it's also lighter, right, I mean, I don't live in Hong Kong, but it must be pretty humid here. It's slightly easier to wear than uh, the English tailoring. Yeah, I mean, in terms of weight, definitely Italian tailoring is lighter. Uh, however, I think in terms of comfort, a well-made suit, a well-made jacket should be comfortable. It doesn't matter where it's made. So I, I don't think comfort is an issue. Maybe it's just a, a preconception of what is comfortable. That's Especially what's compared to a ready-to-wear example of the same style, right? I, I would say that Italian style is more easily adapted to ready-to-wear compared to British style. That's a good point. Uh, any more questions? I was just wondering, um, Thomas Mason, Albini, Thomas Mason, tells us that they sell quite a lot of women's um, fabrics for women's shirts. So I'm just wondering whether that is a trend in Hong Kong and China uh, for women's shirts. Is there a growing trend? Well, basically, um, it's very curious you ask that because uh, we will come out with a new swatch book uh, by the 1st of May in Europe and then later on into Asia. Where for the first time, we're going to put a booklet for MTM fabrics for women. Now, the issue is, and I agree a bit with the panel, it's uh, very interesting because I personally believe and my whole team believes that there's a market for that. The problem is finding manufacturers, yeah, because uh, also in Italy, we for sure, it's something that has become more popular. Uh, the sartorial way of dressing for women, it's something that comes from high fashion, that for sure is something that is pushed. So probably, yes, we go towards that trend, and Albini is of course, or Thomas Mason is picking up on that. The question is, are we going to find the manufacturers that want to do it? In Italy, we have for sure, in all of Europe, shirt makers that refuse to do it. They refuse because they say it's, it's too difficult. They're more probably, with what George was saying before as well, afraid of maybe losing other clients. Mostly we see an opportunity as a fabric supplier because we notice that a lot of the women go to the shirt makers and pick the fabrics for their men. So why shouldn't they have an own booklet and, uh, and choose something? So let's see, it's a, it's a risk that we are going to take as a fabric supplier. We hope that uh, manufacturers follow, absolutely. Do you, see, do you see a trend of more women buying shirts from you? Um, um, for Escort chain, we always make women shirts. Um, but uh, of course, we can never satisfy all of them. Because uh, uh, for ladies, uh, as George mentioned that, uh, before, that uh, there are tailors that afraid to make women shirts because, because it's hard to get the get the matching right, you know, whether the expectation of the shirt that the ladies want. Uh, what we always tell our customers that we the lady shirt that we made is very man style. If you're looking for man style lady shirts, I'm sure a lot of tailors here in Hong Kong do they can make it. Because, uh, uh, then that means that the cutting of the shirt is more a man style. Because when you come to a lady shirt, the definition can be very, very broad. It can be very a lot of frills or a lot of different, uh, more feminine uh, kind of uh, shirts. It's then the, the tailor cannot sometimes chop the print. Any other questions? Was there one at the back? Yeah. Um, it was especially heartening to hear George speak about the um, excellence and craft that's been demonstrated in mainland China and Hong Kong for a sustained period of time, not, not just in clothing manufacturing, but also in ceramics, homewares, other areas of 
areas of design. Um, but it's not something which is particularly appreciated by people who are from Hong Kong or China, in my personal observation. And I've analyzed this qualitatively at length. So my question is, what approach would you, as you know, as outstanding retailers, um, use in order to convince people locally within China and Hong Kong that their own craft industries are worth supporting? Because what we've noticed, in particular in the luxury media sector, is that a lot of independent menswear retailers, they end up stocking European brands, Italian brands, German brands, English brands, um, and they are marketing and selling directly to their own population in China and, you know, for the most part in Hong Kong as well. So that question is, um, how do you draw attention and appreciation back to, um, you know, the craftsmen and the artisans here in China and Hong Kong? The situation is actually really similar to Japanese brands and Japan. Right? Like, in general, um, I think a lot of Japanese don't fully appreciate how great their domestic brands are. And so for a lot of Japanese brands, their first port of call will be, how do I export this? They don't even necessarily think about their domestic market. They say, how do I export this first, build an audience overseas, and use that as a way to attract interest domestically? And there's no reason why that wouldn't work in Hong Kong or in China either. Well, you know, in, in, my, in my case in particular, I, I never set up Rio as a promoter of local craft. We have always been about, you know, more or less Italian style with English taste. It's kind of hard, you know, define our aesthetic. And, you know, we have always been about working with, you know, makers that have authenticity. Um, because I think we're not just selling the product, we're also selling the culture behind the product. So we don't actually have a lot of things that are manufactured in China. But pretty soon after we started business, I approached Patrick from WWHN because I really wanted to use my platform to promote a local craftsman. And you know, for me, by setting certain standards of my own business and playing in that level, then hopefully when I bring another Chinese brand or Chinese craftsman on board, that's going to be a signal to the market that it's an excellent choice, you know, it's an excellent option. Um, what I said earlier, I think, you know, was more for people who are, you know, running local tailor shops, you know, who are having 100% production in China. And I think, you know, if, you're, if that's your main business, then I think there should be a responsibility to promote the craftsman. Any other last questions before we all go for a drink and some food? Not that I should dissuade you from asking another question. Please go ahead if you have one. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, we have one more in the back. So um, the last bit of question is coming from someone like um, myself who comes from a slightly similar background to George who has been uh, part of a white collar population and then having uh, an interest starting into the menswear trade. And I guess the question really is how do we as the business whether it could be the business of fashion really could be some uh, digital consultants or it could be investment bankers or really those who work on the business side of things, then how can we work to help um, bring forward the traditions, not so to help um, promote the prosperity of the menswear trade? Can be coming from the, for example, predicting the customer analytics to predict, to predict, for example, the demand of, of women's shirts can be around um, helping the demands from some, some small factories, just like um, George has mentioned previously. Then really, the, just to summarize the word, and how can we as the business help the world of menswear or the trade? You, you guys work with any external businesses to help? <laughs> That's always well. I think, of course, you know, you know, buy and wear it, but also share what you love, and be selective about what you buy and who you buy from. Um, don't go for, you know, the, the business that are just a price arbitrage. You know, buy from someone whose price may be a little bit higher, but have priced in other values into the purchase. Um, you know, I think be a smart consumer. Really. I think that's an interesting point we were talking about earlier when we were running to the points we were going to talk about was that when I, I personally find that as a, as a consumer I take um, 
much more like, I'm much more likely to buy from brands that I know or I have a relationship with or that have a shop that I've known and frequented over time. Um, partly through laziness, um, and I, I don't have the time to kind of rattle through all the different kind of online stores trying to find the best possible price. Um, but also just feel like I am actually supporting something when I buy one of these places. You know, even if I buy from you know, the Armour Online and someone else is selling it, you know, a similar thing, but it's only an online store, part of me is thinking actually, you know, I really like the experience of going to the Armoury stores, even though they only do it once or twice a year. And it's part of it that is actually kind of supporting it, because I understand it, I know the suppliers they use and so on. If I use the word um, as a patron, right? I think that's the word we used earlier. Like you're acting as a, as a patron to someone really kind of supporting. I think that's a really nice idea, a nice way to think about kind of consuming these kind of menswear products. Thank you very much, everyone. That was, that was a good round of questions. Thank you very much, particularly to the questions from the female members of the audience. That's much appreciated and very rare in these discussions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to everyone for coming. Uh, thank you to Albini for being our wonderful sponsor this evening. Thank you to our wonderful speakers, to Toby, Tony, Mark, and George. Um, we are going to go and have some drinks and some food just through that door in the bar, right? That is correct, Simon. That is correct. Through um, that I'm door. stand here and block everybody because we all need to go and enjoy the party. <laughs> so please go and have a drink with us. Thank you very much.